Om Sri Sai Ram. Sai Ram, dear brothers and sisters, welcome to the 18th edition of Samarpan program here at Sarvadharma Service Center in Farmingdale Borough, Howell Township, New Jersey, United States. On this special day, when we celebrate Eid al Fitr, the culmination of the fasting month of Ramadan, Akshaya Tritiya, the third lunar day of the spring month of Vaisakha, the day Akshaya Patra, the inexhaustible vessel, was given to Draupadi by the Lord Krishna during the visit of Sage Durvasa. It's also a day of remembrance for the loved ones who have passed on, which has a significance to me personally because my mother passed on this very day. And also, yes, as you all know, our dear brother, Krishnamurti Kasturi's brother just passed a few moments ago on this special day as well. This is, of course, the Aradhana day of our dear Bhagwan. The very day our Lord chose to leave his physical presence from Mother Earth. The actual day is Monday, April 24th, two days from now. Today, I have the honor to introduce our Samarpan speaker for the month, our dear brother, Dr. Sivaraman Eggiraman, MD, MRCP, FACC, FHRS. Brother Eggiraman is a cardiologist with specialization in electrophysiology, EP. Dr. Eggiraman first had Darshana Bhagwan in 1998. Since 2002, he has been fortunate to get opportunity to serve at the Sri Satisai Institute of Higher Medical Sciences, commonly called as a super specialty hospital in Whitefield, Bangalore, India. He also attends two annual cardiac electrophysiology workshops conducted by that institution every year. Dr. Agiraman also had the privilege to attend to Swami during Swami's last physical days while admitted to the super specialty hospital at Puttaparthi, Andhra Pradesh. How much more apt it can be that today for Aradhana Day, we have Dr. Agiraman to be our speaker. Education wise, Dr. Agiraman did his Bachelor of Medicine and Bachelor of Surgery called MBBS at the Jawaharlal Institute of Postgraduate Medical Education and Research, popularly called JIPMER, uh, in Pondicherry under the University of Madras in 1975, followed by Doctor of Medicine, MD in General Medicine at University of Madras in 1978, followed by membership of the Royal College of Physicians of the United Kingdom, MRCP, in 1980, followed by certification in internal medicine by the American Board of Internal Medicine in 1985, and then certification in cardiovascular diseases in 1987, followed by certification in cardiac electrophysiology in 1992, with recertifications in 2002 and 2012. Dr. Agya Raman was senior resident Medicine at Jipmer, Pondicherry, India, GB Panth Hospital, New Delhi, India, Senior House Officer and Registrar in Medicine and Cardiology at Rush Green Hospital, Ramford, Essex, UK, Chief Resident at Lincoln Hospital, Bronx, New York, and a Fellow in Cardiovascular Diseases and Cardiac Electrophysiology at Deborah Heart Lung Center, Browns Mills, New Jersey. Currently, Dr. Giraman is attending, is attending cardio, cardiac electrophysiologist at Virtua Cardiology, Cherry Hill, New Jersey. Dr. Giraman lives in Cherry Hill, New Jersey with his wife, Sister Vijay Lakshmi, who is here with us today. They have three sons, Anand, Ravi, and Nikhil, who are also making imprint in their own ways. On the Sai front in the United States, Dr. Eggy Raman is a very active member of the Medford Sai Center in New Jersey. For us at Sarva Dharma, Dr. Eggy Raman is a very special brother, as he is involved in several seva activities at the center, despite his very busy schedule. He has conducted 
cardiopulmonary resuscitation, CPR sessions for members of the center and has taken keen interest in medical programs at the center. Besides other activities, Dr. Egiraman is an excellent bhajan singer, as we all saw today, and participates in devotional activities at the center. As many of us will also remember, we also enjoyed his bhajan lead at the recent Mahashivratri program here at Sarvadharma Service Center. With this, I would like to invite Brother Dr. Egiraman to the podium and request him to share with us his experiences with Swami for the next 70 minutes or so. Welcome, brother, Saira. Om Sri Sai Ram, I offer my most humble pranams at Bhagawan's lotus feet. Most beloved Bhagawan, dear brothers and sisters, Sai Ram, to you all, it is high honor and a great privilege to be invited amongst you on this particular day, this very special day. And uh, thank you, Brother Sai Barade, for all those very nice words which elevated me all the way there, whereas I still live here. <clears throat> so I was wondering, as you were speaking, I was wondering what Swami would say. I have to come down here but it's my firm and wish that not only for myself, for everybody, that Swami would continue to lift us up on our upward path. He has another way of equalizing. He can also bring us down, but he hardly ever does it. So uh, when, when uh, I was asked to uh, 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 speak today, um, I asked myself, uh, what is the meaning of Samarpan? And as you all know much better than me, uh, it has several meanings. It's dedication to the Lord or divine surrender. And really, Swami gives us very many unique experiences. In fact, everything <clears throat> I feel, you know, from the time you're born until, you know, you, you merge, uh, everything is his gift, his prasadam. But there are certain events, certain experiences that tend to linger in our minds. And when we talk about them, when we narrate them, there is something special that happens. And it doesn't matter whether we narrate or it is narrated to us, because it is all Swami's prasadam. The narration and the narrative that is all his. And that's what gives us this tremendous amount of bliss. We all feel that we are having a front seat to the events long after the events have happened. Uh, so I'm deeply thankful for you all to uh, having me here, for having me here, so that when I thought of what I should talk about, I relived a lot of my memories. So I have to start somewhere. So let me start with this. Swami has said that man plans his present according to his past, whereas God plans the future according to the present. And nowhere is this more relevant than what I have experienced. Um, as you heard before, I won't go into details. I did my <clears throat> MBBS from Jipma Pondicherry, very nice seaside town. And uh, that was my first experience away from home. Uh, and then I did my post-graduation in internal medicine. Then I got some experience in the UK. 
Then I came to the USA and eventually I became a, trained to be a cardiologist. And uh, at that time, there was, a, <clears throat> there was a fork in the road. I could have chosen to go either as a non-invasive cardiologist or I could have become a plumber, putting in stents, becoming an electro uh, invasive uh, cardiologist. Or there was a new nascent field that had just come up and that is cardiac electrophysiology. And uh, at that time, not many people kind of were aware of what electrophysiology was. And I remember my chief uh, uh, where I trained, <clears throat> he asked me, uh, aren't you going to apply for interventional cardiology? Because he was the chief of interventional cardiologists. And I told him that I've already committed myself to cardiac electrophysiology. So he looked at me and he said, are you sure? Do you really want to do it? I said, yes. He said, why do you want to do it? I almost said it, but it's a good thing I didn't say it because I wanted to tell him that uh, with cardiac electrophysiology, um, it's like playing, playing chess. You have to think about the arrhythmias, your regular heartbeat and have a game plan. Whereas, you know, being a plumber, you know, you just um, dilate and put stents and, you know, Good thing I didn't say that. Um, so um, I finished my cardiac electrophysiology training. And when I trained, <clears throat> we were still going into the operating room and we were helping the surgeons map certain irregular rapid heartbeats and directing them what to do. But as you know, we cardiologists over the years uh, have become good at copying what the surgeons do with our catheters. So over the next decade and or two decades, we have learned how to put these catheters, snake them in through the blood vessels and bring them into the heart and do what the surgeons were doing with open chest surgery with our catheters. So that's been a huge development over time. <clears throat> so <clears throat> where shall I, you know, start regarding my, you know, uh, initial journey at Swami's Hospital. Now, before that, in, I believe it was in the year 2000, um, we had, you know, Vijay and I, with the three children, we had gone to uh, India, and we had that upanayanam there, the upanayanam of my second son, Ravi, and third son, Nikhil. <clears throat> and that was in Chennai. But before that, we went to Patti, and uh, we went for darshan. And, uh, before we went for darshan, when we checked into the hotel, we had, uh, I saw a picture of Bhagwan with, it is the most beautiful picture I'd seen, you know, uh, it was, light was streaming from behind them, and it had this halo around him, and he had his hands raised in Abhayasta, and uh, I simply fell in love with that picture, so much so, you know, what desire, you know, you want the picture. And it was, it was kind of framed. And I told myself that I would ask the hotel people whether they would sell it to me so that I can take it with me. But we went for darshan. And as you know, once you go for darshan, uh, you don't want anything else. You know, you're in a different state of frame of mind. <clears throat> and uh, th there was one person who actually met with us there, young gentleman by the name of Radhakrishnan. He, he took us around. He was talking to the uh, boys about Swami's teaching, Swami's uh, quotes, and, uh, and he also told me just spontaneously that, oh, I'll take you to Swami's photographer's shop. And, but once you have Swami's darshan, you know, the mind does not uh, latch on to anything else. So the next thing I remember about the picture was when I was driving back to Bangalore, I thought, oh, I should have, you know, asked the hotel people whether I can purchase the picture, but I forgot about it. And uh, anyway, there's always the next time. So we go to Bangalore, then we go to Chennai for the Upanayanam. On the morning of the Upanayanam, there, <clears throat> there were two homagundas set up. Uh, Vijay and I were doing it for our middle son, Ravi, and for our younger son, Nikhil, uh, my older brother and his wife, they were doing it. And the priests were all seated. And they said, come. And right across the hall, there was a table, and on the table was uh, a picture, 
and with, with the sunshine streaming from behind it. And I went closer and it was Swami's picture. Swami's picture with the light catching his hair and his hands raised. And I looked around and I said, I asked whose picture, there was also a picture of Lord Subramanya, who's uh, Swaminada, who's our uh, Kuladevam. So I said, whose picture, who brought this picture? I know the other picture is ours, but, and uh, so nobody, nobody knew where the picture came. <laughs> Finally, my sister, my wife's sister-in-law, her name is also Viji. She said, I brought it. <clears throat> I said, where did you get this picture? She said, you know, a few days ago, we went to Shirdi Sai temple with the Upanayanam invitation. And uh, there is an elderly lady there, they call her Baba Bhati. And we gave her the uh, uh, invitation. And she said, wait, she went inside the room, <clears throat> brought this picture and said, give it to them to take it back home. So the Lord had fulfilled our desire, even before the desire was planted. So, <clears throat> so everything has to start from something. So um, during an early trip, I believe it was in 2000, uh, I happened to be talking to Dr. Keshav Prasad, who is uh, the chief of cardiology at, uh, uh, at uh, Supraswati Hospital in Parthi. <clears throat> And he said, hey, you know, what's your specialty? And I said, cardiology. He said, no, within cardiology, what do you do? He said, I do cardiac electrophysiology, which deals in arrhythmias, rapid heartbeats, you know, uh, pacemakers, defibrillators. He said, we don't, we have interventional cardiologists, we have non-invasive cardiologists, we have cardiac thoracic surgeons, but we don't have electrophysiologists. So why don't you start here why don't you come why don't you do lectures why don't you start doing some cases we have some new equipment so i said okay and at that time during the darshan i'd seen that the doctors would be seated in the veranda area and uh, everybody else was uh, you know formed lines and there were tokens and there was celebration jubilation you might remember if somebody got a token number one or two or three or four, a lot of anxiety if you got token number 22 and, you know, so on, you know. So, <clears throat> so I came back here <clears throat> and I took my CV <clears throat> and they also said, you know, could you please send a copy of the, or your picture also, because those days they were showing it to, you know, Bhagwan. So <clears throat> as I got my uh, papers together, the thought suddenly came to me, are you going there to do service? Or are you going there to do service because you want darshan? You want to sit in the veranda? <clears throat> and, I, and I was very uncomfortable with the thought. And it was a very intrusive thought. So I put all the papers down <clears throat> and do it, didn't do anything for a couple of weeks. Then again, I took it up and I said, you know, he has told me to mail the thing, I should do that. Again, the same thing came, you know, in my mind. <clears throat> are you going there to do service? Or are you going there to do service with the intention of sitting there in the veranda? <clears throat> and I said, no, I, I put everything down. And this kept happening every month. Every time I would pick up the, you know, my CV, it would happen. <clears throat> then after some time, I said, okay, how do I beat this thought in my mind? I said, no, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going for darshan. Then the thought came, but you, you, you're thinking this way, are you going to change your mind once you go there? I said, okay, put the thing down again. So, so this went on for nine months. <clears throat> Meanwhile, Dr. Keshe Prasad couldn't understand why I was not sending in my CV. And uh, then finally he said, you know, send it in, you know, we really need somebody. <clears throat> so I sent it in. And about a week or 10 days later, I got a very prompt reply from the administrative officer saying, uh, Sairam, we don't need any more doctors. <laughs> I saw that 
And you would think that I would be disappointed. I was so happy. I said, thank you, Swami, for giving me such a direct answer. This has been put to rest. My mind has been restless. Now it is completely clear. That is that. <clears throat> then a couple of weeks later, Dr. Keshav Prasad was in, US, in the US visiting family. <clears throat> and he called me. He said, Arey, you haven't sent this CV at all. I said, no, no, sir, I sent it. But uh, I got rejected. So he said, what? I said, yes. He said, would you send it to? I said, the reply is from the administrative officer. He says, oh, let me tell you what happened. <clears throat> One day, Swami was at Darshan. It was about 8.15 or 8.20 in the morning. And uh, Swami looks around the veranda and he sees the doctor sitting there. He calls uh, the administrative officer and says, uh, is the hospital closed today? So, so the administrative officer says, no, Swami. He says, oh, uh, are there very few patients today? No patients today? He said, no, Swami. He said, then why are all these people still sitting here? <laughs> so, so he felt personally responsible. He was petrified. <clears throat> he told somebody, you know, these doctors come, they sit here, they don't go to the hospital. I get blamed, I'm not going to allow anybody else. And that's when my application landed and he said, rejected. <clears throat> so, so Dr. Keshpura said, send it to me. So I sent it to him. And uh, a week later, he said, you know, you're on. He said, I have good news for you, but I have bad news. He said, the good news is that you've been approved. But the bad news is the equipment the equipment there, which was under covers, has been shifted to the super specialty hospital in Bangalore. And I said, fantastic. I said, this dilemma is over. It's gone. I don't have to think about darshan. I don't have to think about anything. No distractions. I said, thank you so very much. So then I planned my first trip. That was in 2002. <clears throat> so when I first went there, uh, Dr. Das, who is the chief of uh, uh, cardiology, uh, absolutely golden hands. Swami has blessed him, you know, wonderful, perhaps one of the best interventional cardiologists that I've ever, ever, ever seen, worked with. So except that they they never done electrophysiology cases. So the first day I spent looking at the equipment because the equipment was totally new. It was different from what we have in the U.S. And I asked one of the technicians, I remember, where's the manual for this? Because once you start the fast heartbeat, you have to be able to stop it with program stimulation, and you have to know exactly what to do very quickly. So that was a task given to, you know, uh, Narsimha Bihara, Brother Bihara. He, he's now in the US. Uh, he's very successful. So then we started doing the cases. And I remember the following day, we did the first uh, implantation of a defibrillator uh, for patients uh, you know, to prevent sudden cardiac death. And, uh, and on Sunday, I don't know where people were, Monday morning they said, oh, we were in Parthi and we told uh, uh, Swami and Swami blessed us. Uh, we told him that you know, we did the first implant. Since then, Swami has given me an opportunity to go there twice a year and, uh, uh, and, and, and just looking back at the whole approval process, Swami has said, you know, no, you know, God is not going to ask where you did your seva or when you did the seva, he's going to ask with what motive you did the seva. And, uh, and so what I'd like to share with you is, uh, you know, uh, uh, we, since then, you know, twice a year, we started the electrophysiology program and we, you know, it just grown and grown and grown. Uh, we go there twice a year uh, doing a cardiac electrophysiology workshop. And one of my other friends from Phoenix, uh, Dr. Garg, he also comes and, you know, we do it, we do it for a week at a time. And there've been other electrophysiologists who also have joined uh, wonderful people. So, so uh, let, let me, me let, let me, 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 me let me tell you about uh, this little girl 
who who actually taught me about faith so the way it is there are two labs <clears throat> one is the where the interventional cardiologists you know would be working <coughs> and the other lab where we, we had the electrophysiology equipment and then in between was this big console area so on the interventional side there would be coronary cases a lot of congenital cases a lot of patients with rheumatic heart disease you know valve being dilated and there was this girl who was led in through the corridor and she kept saying siram 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 and as she came as she came nearer and nearer to the lab her voice just went up she said siram 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 and usually the children have to be carried in you know but this girl refused to be carried in she just walked in and she went and i remember stood near the table they picked her up put her on the table and uh, and she said her voice increased again siram siram they put her down they started the iv and most children would cry they would cry out for uh, their mother but she only cried out for her divine mother and they started giving the anesthetic and she said at the top of her lungs she just kept saying siram siram and at that point in time you know i was you know at that time i thought i was just an observer and i thought it's a child with a, either an atrial septal defect or ventricular septal defect for whom a heart catheterization is done before surgery <clears throat> So I asked the chief technician, Brother Duwakar, I said, uh, Brother Duwakar, who, who is this patient? I thought he was going to say, you know, somebody, he said, sir, it's your next patient. I said, really? I said, uh, where, is, where is she from? Swami student. So then I looked at the chart and she had a history of very rapid heartbeat, 240 beats per minute, 250 beats per minute, which would make her you know, lighted, dizzy, and even faint. And the medication was not controlling her. And at that point, it hit me that, you know, we had to do the procedure. And I looked at Swami's picture, and I said, Swami, you know, you can do anything, you can do everything. Why did you send her here? Why did you send her here when I'm here? <laughs> you know, because now the pressure was building up. So, so we started, Dr. Das and I, we started doing the procedure. And basically, you know, the heart has two upper chambers, two lower chambers. And all of us have just one electrical connection between the upper and lower chambers. Whereas this child had an extra electrical connection. So electricity was just going round and round and making the heart go very fast. And right from the time we put our, you know, catheters through the groin, her heartbeat was extremely fast, 240, 250, we were unable to control it. And what we had to do was, we had to use a needle and go through the wall that separates the two upper chambers. It's called a septal puncture. And then we go to the left upper chamber and we put a catheter there, hunt around as to where the tract is and then burn it with radio frequency energy that you deliver. We used a pediatric catheter, we used a pediatric sheath. We mapped for 45 minutes, one hour, we gave several, we tried and tried and tried. Nothing happened. The rapid heartbeat did not budge. And it started sinking on me that we might be unsuccessful, which meant that the poor girl had to go back and she would experience the same palpitation. And uh, so, because there is in Swami's hospital, there's always Swami's picture. Swami's picture is there everywhere. Those days they used to play bhajans also, which was perfect. So I looked at Swami's picture and said, Swami, um, I realized that all this while I said, I thinking, you know, why don't we do this? Why don't I do that? I said, Swami, cannot do it. You have to do it. I said, it's your responsibility. I'm foolish in thinking I can do this. I cannot do this. <clears throat> Then I was talking to Dr. Das, you know, we were both scrubbed in. We said, what, should, what else shall we do? And he said, you know, maybe we'll use an adult sheet, you know, which is much bigger, it's thicker. He said, yes, let's use that. Then I remembered a catheter that I brought. It's an adult catheter, it's a bigger catheter. I said, why don't we use that catheter? And it's got a special curve. So he put the sheet in, 
put the catheter in and we mapped, we stepped on the pedal and the tract was gone in five seconds. So, so I, you know, we, we did some more testing <clears throat> and the tract was no longer there. And, <clears throat> and so I unscrubbed and I came out <clears throat> and I thought to myself, there is something here that I need to learn from this. What is it? So I felt that <clears throat> the little girl's faith was tremendous. So this girl had faith. She called for her divine mother. She had strength of faith, as Swami has said. And Swami has said this, you have to have confidence in that strength of faith. And uh, the second thing was, I felt, I thought Swami would appear, but then I thought, with what form is Swami going to appear? Swami can appear in any way. He can appear as an idea. He can appear as a suggestion from somebody. As long as we are hollow on the inside without ego, so that we can receive it, we're in good shape. So I thought that was, so the next day I was very curious. I wanted to go <clears throat> talk to this girl, I went there during rounds and this girl was sleeping and she seemed to be half the size she was the previous day, you know. I mean, the way she was saying Om Sai Ram, you know, it, is, it, just, it just blew everybody off. Um, there, are, there are a couple of other instances I can, <clears throat> I can talk about. Um, years ago, uh, there was a, this doctor, uh, he, I believe he was a general practitioner in Odisha. And he used to do a lot of <clears throat> charity work. You see patients, never cared to, you know, although, you know, he, he would just go to the poorest of poor neighborhoods and he would just offer his services. And he developed a condition called cardiomyopathy where the heart muscle is weak and he had, the, his conduction system was weak and he needed a special defibrillator, uh, which also would resynchronize the lower chain. And the cost of the whole thing at that time, <clears throat> with the surgery, <clears throat> was quoted at eight lakhs. And his wife's, uh, his in-laws, they said they would arrange, he didn't have the money. They said they would arrange for it at, uh, at, uh, in Delhi. <clears throat> and he didn't want to borrow the money. He didn't want to place himself under any obligation. But it had to be done. Then he had a dream. <clears throat> Swami's figure came in the dream <clears throat> and told him, Super Swagati Hospital. Then next day he was confused. Uh, then he asked some people and uh, they got in touch with somebody, I think from the Samiti. And uh, they said, is this the person that you saw? He said, yes, this is the picture. They said, this is uh, the Bhagavan Siddh Sai Baba. And what did he say? He said, Super Swagati Hospital. And he said, you have to go to Super Swagati Hospital. So <clears throat> his in-laws didn't like this idea of going somewhere, you know, but they, they wanted him to go to Delhi. So he, his wife, and I think his two children, they got into the train from Bhuvaneshwar. And uh, so he, he bought a ticket for Parthi. So they were about half an hour from Parthi and his wife was sleeping, children were sleeping. And he also kind of nodded off and he had another dream. And Swami is telling him, Bangalore, not Puttaparthi. <laughs> so, so he wakes up and he says, uh, to go to Bangalore, not Puttaparthi, Puttaparthi station is coming up. So he, he didn't dare to wake his wife up and tell her that we're going to a different place. As it is, she thought that he was crazy. So, Anyway, long and the short of it is the story is he, he came to the hospital, he got the defibrillator, and years later, he got a replacement of the defibrillator, and his heart muscle function improved. Sometimes we think that we are actually given the choice of doing something, but Swami, Swami has his own ways of doing it. Um, one of the early trips, <clears throat> they had presented two patients. Uh, with a heart muscle problem and they needed the special pacemaker. 
but we had only one. Then that was the donated one that, you know, taken some equipment from here. And I was feeling, and they said, you know, you have to choose which one to put it in. I said, Sairam, how can I choose? He said, you tell me which patient to put it in, I'll put it in, you know, but I can't choose between one and the other, given, and they said, you know, all the parameters are the same, both of them. Then I thought to myself, I know that you did the echocardiogram only last month, but can we do the echo again? So they had the echo machine, they brought the patients. And in one of them, the heart muscle function had spontaneously improved. So there's only one other person whose heart muscle function had not improved, who qualified for the uh, special pacemaker. So we did that. And I came over and I was so relieved that I didn't have to make the decision. So after I came back, my wife said, uh, you know, you know, we just call, you know, his name is, you know, Sri Kale, you know, he said, you know, he, he, uh, he had called when you were away, he wanted to speak to you. So I called him. And he said, Oh, by the way, you know, one of my relatives, he is, uh, I think he was a headmaster of uh, Swami school. Uh, his mother uh, needs a, a special pacemaker. So I wanted to just call you and tell you one of your trips, you know, uh, they may come to see you. And he said, they also went to, he's a Swami student. So he went to Swami and said, Swami, my mother. And even before he finished saying anything, Swami said, I believe somebody is going to come from USA and your mother will get the pacemaker. And all this happened before even my trip. So I always wonder, you know, what am I doing? You know, there's nothing in my hands. It's, it just happens. You're just there. You just go along and do what you have to do. Um, I, I always ask myself, uh, I would ask myself, you know, what is it that actually belongs to me? I mean, if, if everything has been given to you, uh, uh, it's Swami's will that, you know, it's, you know, you do this or you're in this situation or that, what is it? What about my thoughts? So I've wondered about this. So one of the, uh, one of the trips uh, to the hospital, I happened to go to Parthi and the way I used to do it was we would work in the morning and late afternoon we would take a car, Dr. Das and I, and we would go <clears throat> to Parthi and very often we would be entering from this entrance and Swami would be entering from that and I used to feel very guilty but at the same time I didn't want to miss out working that morning and we would go and sit down there and then you know darshan would be over swami would leave and then we would just leave back to bangalore you know very often so i was sitting there and yes i was sitting on the veranda area <laughs> and uh, swami was sitting there facing everybody and he had this he was sitting on this chair and this wing back chair you know so i could just see the front of his face and this i would say you know it's an insane thought you know, I, this thought came to my head, unless Swami turns his head, leans forward, turns his head, he cannot see anybody on this side, right? No, I mean, you know, as soon as this thought came, Swami just rolled his eyes and he just looked out of the corner of the eye. And I said, oh my gosh. And I just looked away and looked there. Swami was still staring. And now the bhajans receded in the background. There was only panic in my mind and my thoughts were all scattered. And, and again, I looked and again, he had this, he was looking out of the corner of the eye and I said, oh my gosh, when, you know, what did I do? Then I looked again, he was looking, you know, there. And now I was thinking, you have traveled thousands of miles away. You come for darshan for half an hour or 40 minutes. Can't you control your mind? You know how difficult it is to control your mind. You have no control over your thoughts. You come all the way here and instead of having a nice darshan, you have this very silly thought in your mind. And I was just beating myself. I just couldn't. I said, you know, and then suddenly the thought came to my mind. How did Swami know this? <laughs> so, so then I liked that thought, you know, I said, yes, how did Swami know this? Um, so then the other thought came, 
that must be a thought that Swami sent. Then I liked that also. So then I said, Swami, your thought, you own everything, including my thoughts. So it is your thought. So I have nothing to do with it. So why should I feel so bad? So I just want to enjoy the rest of the darshan. And then it's like all that noise went away and the bhajan started resounding and you know everything went back to normal. So, so that was a very powerful uh, you know, lesson that I had. And of course the lesson is concentrate, don't you know, concentrate on the things so that you, Swami has said that it's very difficult to control thoughts, but you think of something or think of a name, form, you know, say it, then it's much easier to, you know, prevent uh, other, other thoughts from coming in. Um, <clears throat> there was, uh, I've always wondered, you know, uh, you go there uh, to the hospital and you meet these wonderful people, Swami students, other people who worked with Swami, and you listen to their experiences. It's like uh, Bhagavatam, you know, you go there and you get all these, you know, you just, and then you come back and you're kind of, you know, living in that for some time until, you know, samsara here, you know, all the burly activities, you know, take over. And uh, uh, so there was one page, there was once when I had a dream. And uh, uh, in the dream, I was doing a, a procedure. I was doing an upgrade of, I think, a defibrillator or a pacemaker. <laughs> And what we ha what I had to do was I had to have access, and then I uh, the patient already had a device, and I had to access the main vein that goes to the heart. And sometimes when you have old leads, there are blockages and uh, small channels which make it very difficult. So in the uh, in the dream, uh, I you know I dissect out and. I go to test the fluoro before I, you know, put, you know, stick the needle and put the wire. And I find that there is no fluoro equipment. In other words, there is no x-ray tube. There is a screen, there's a foot pedal, but there is no x-ray tube. And in my dream, I'm telling myself, you started the case and there's the anesthesia person, the nurses, they're all, you know, doing what they are supposed to do. But I tell myself, you started this case without having an x-ray tube. This is malpractice. How could you do that? And I'm kind of, you know, you know, I'm in the dream. I'm tort torturing myself. I said, how can this be? How can you do this? And it was very real. Until I noticed that <clears throat> there is a figure standing by my side with an orange uh, dress. And that figure says, like this saying step on the pedal and i am thinking in the dream i said yes swami is here but he's saying step on the but there's no x-ray tube again he points down so step on the pedal and the image appears there's no x-ray tube and the image appears and then i'm happy that there's an image and i start doing the procedure and i struggle and then the wire goes in a very particular way and that's all i remember in the dream so i woke up and i said what a strange dream so i go 7 30 i start my first case <clears throat> so hispanic gentleman and every sentence that he would say he would reference jesus he was living in jesus okay and so we started the procedure and there were blockages and i tried and tried and tried and tried the wire wouldn't go through. Then I asked myself, and I told one of the persons who in the room, you know, his name is Mark, you know, about the strange dream, and he knows about Swami. And uh, he, you know, Mark said, Mark just laughed and uh, he just shook his head. And all this happened. And as this is unfolding, he's looking, he's all masked up and uh, gown, you know, and he's looking and he's having, you know, he, his eyes are wide, you know, saying, you know, this is narrative, it's just like what I narrated before. And then I remembered the dream, then I put the wire exactly the way I saw in the dream. It went through, we were able to finish the procedure. So as I unscrubbed, uh, I felt good, I felt good. I said, thank you, Swami, you know, he helped out. But the focus was totally different, you know. After the procedure, I went to the recovery room 
and the patient had woken up and I talked to him. Then I realized why Swami had done what he had done. This man is so spiritually evolved, so full of love, that Swami had to be there. Swami had to be there to make sure that it was a safe and successful you know, procedure. And I just feel very fortunate that somewhere along the line, I was a small instrument to, to, to see it through and have the wonderful experience. Um, <clears throat> there's, uh, uh, Sarah, Maharaj, we have a little bit of time. Okay. <clears throat> now, uh, there are some things that we think are profound that, you know, we like to narrate, but there are some very, uh, very, uh, uh, you know, mundane things that also happen, you know, that puts us into panic. So one of the trips to Bangalore was coming back and I was coming up, I remember the British Airways flight and from London to, you know, Philadelphia, uh, they had, uh, I, I had, I'd slept off. And then I woke up, I was looking for my glasses and I couldn't find my glasses. Then I remembered the last thing I know is my glasses were on the tray table and uh, I don't see it anymore. But the tray table was, you know, folded all the way. I looked down and everywhere and I couldn't. Then I said, okay, let me just open the, open the tray table. My glasses were in one plane. It had been totally squashed and I, I was horrified. I said, okay, I have to work the next morning. It was already evening and uh, I had to drive. And I, and I tried to straighten it and I broke it. <clears throat> now I was thinking, you know, what will I do tomorrow? I have to drive. It's a Sunday evening. I can't get it fixed. You know, I can't do my procedures, you know, and, you know, I go on a trip like this, but coming back, you know, why was I so careless? You know, you, you know, a lot of things. So we land there and, you know, my wife had come to pick me up and she said, where is your glasses? I said, you know, it's broken. So as you were driving, I remembered one of my son's uh, friend's father, you know, he was an optometrist. So just happened to call and he was in the shore somewhere. He said, oh yeah, I come. And so he asked me to come that evening, that night to his house. I had a spare frame. He put the glasses, everything was fixed. And I thought to myself, you know, I mean, the Lord, you know, he can do anything and everything from the most subtle things to the complicated things, you know. So it's just that our mind, you know, we panic in our minds. And uh, if you'll permit me, I'd just like to share one other, uh, 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 one other experience in the lab here. <clears throat> um, we had this patient who came in with a heart attack and who needed a pacemaker because his heartbeat, he didn't have a heartbeat, you know, after the surgery. But he was extremely, extremely, extremely sick. He was on a lot of medicines to prop up his blood pressure. And he was on other things to help us, you know, cardiac output. And uh, he needed a pacemaker. But at the same time, the surgeons wanted the pacemaker done that day, although he was so unstable. And we discussed it, and I felt that just the act of transporting him from the uh, uh, from the cardiothoracic unit to the electrophysiology laboratory and back might just be too much for him. He would decompensate, you know, he would crash. But they said, no, we want it. I said, okay, fine. So I said, Swami, in your hands. So we took the patient to the electrophysiology laboratory. I started the case. And I thought this was going to be unbelievably difficult, but everything just flowed. Everything just flowed. And I said, I said, thank you, Swami. You know, you know, I, I, you know, I can't, I can't express you know, enough gratitude for this. And at that time, you know, the, you know how the nurses are speaking and others are talking and everything. <clears throat> Through all that, I heard this. And I'm going to play this for you. So 
So it's the sound of Om that keeps happening over and over and over again. <clears throat> and this is caused from the ventilator system. Okay. So I thought I was imagining it, but then it just came Om, Om, Om. So I, and of course, nobody was aware of it. So again, this person, Mark, you know, he was there and I called him and I said, come. So he said, I said, you know, and everybody was talking, nobody was paying attention. I said, I want you to listen. So he would listen. Then his eyes brightened up. He said, this is Om, you know. So, so yes, so, so Swami can manifest in so many, so many, so many ways. And uh, everything, you know, is his. Um, I'd like to just uh, conclude by uh, drawing attention to our center, Sarvadharma Service Center. <clears throat> you people do so much of service and as do a lot of other, you know, centers. Uh, Swami has emphasized Seva. And over the years when I would make the trips to the hospital, um, there would be a lot of challenges. Challenges in getting equipment. Equipment is expensive. They have to go there. Uh, you know, there's the customs, and then sometimes you hand carry it. And uh, I remember once uh, 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 they stopped me and they said, and I would always, whatever I took, I would package in a big cardboard box saying medical equipment, this side up, fragile, everything, big letters. <clears throat> and they would put it in and they would say, you know, okay, what is in there? So that time, uh, this, I'm digressing, but I, you know, I thought I'd just uh, narrate this. So this is at five in the morning. And uh, so one of the customs officers said, uh, sir, um, and he was asking me about it. When the chief of customs, he came down and he told him, uh, I'll handle this. And he asked me, uh, come with me. So I had my luggage. So I took the luggage and there was, a, this was the old uh, airport in uh, HAL airport, you know, so he took us off to another <clears throat> side uh, room, hall. And he said, <clears throat> what is in this? So I told him it's medical equipment, uh, catheters. You know. <clears throat> so he said, uh, uh, where are you taking it? So I said, I'm taking it to one of the charitable, charity hospitals. He said, which hospital? And I said, Swami's hospital. And he said, uh, Tell me about experience that you had at Swami. So it's <laughs> five o'clock in the morning and uh, uh, I wasn't prepared. That. So I tried to, you know, I tried to say that, you know, sir, if you come to the hospital in the morning, I'll put you in touch with a lot of people who had wonderful experiences. He said, no, 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 no. I want you to tell me your experience. What is what is the miracle that has that you have witnessed? <clears throat> and I thought I never had an interview. I never had any thing, you know, no materializations, no, you know, no rings. So what can I tell him? Then again, I told him that you know there are so. He said, "No, I want you to tell me what is." And I told him that I don't know why I said this, but uh, you know, it's like a study circle. But all of a sudden, five o'clock in the morning. So I told him that uh, I've never been, you know, personally involved, you know, I've never had any materializations done for me, but his greatest miracle for me is the change, the transformation that has set forth in me. He looked at me, he raised both the hands and he said, go. So I went to the hospital later that morning and uh, I told them about what happened. And their reaction was, they laughed and they laughed and they laughed. <laughs> because for them, it was very clear as to, you know, and, you know, but, uh, but I thought, uh, you know, so I, I've been thinking about that, you know, since then, you know, because it is, a, I feel that it's a question for me to ponder over, not only now, but for, years to come. And we all, as we all know, when Swami gives us an experience, 
we have a certain meaning at that time. This is certain significance in a year, certain significance in five years, 10 years, etc. So the challenges that, uh, you know, we faced uh, in carrying the program forward on many, many, many fronts, you know, uh, like, you know, be healthy enough to go there, you need, you know, everything. So, and all the things here to be looked after. So it reminds me of uh, uh, a story that uh, Swami had narrated regarding Anjaneya when uh, Anjaneya volunteered to go to Lanka. So uh, Lord Rama asked uh, Anjaneya, uh, have you been to Lanka before? And Anjaneya says, no, my Lord. He said, have you seen Mother Sita before? He says, no, my Lord. Uh, do you know how to cross the ocean to go to Lanka? He says, no, my Lord. He said, then how are you able to say you're going to do it? And Anjaneya says, my Lord, if you instruct me, if you ask me to go, then you are going to give me the strength, the resources, the knowledge, the courage, and everything else to make it happen. So on that note, I would like to express my uh, heartfelt gratitude to Bhagawan. And I would like to thank all of you for having me here today, Sairam. Sairam, uh, Dr. Rama, in one of our conversations when we were talking some time back, I think when we went to Prabhakar's house also, so you had told me, I had asked you, how do you feel when you open the heart and see it? I'm see sorry, the, how see, do you? Feel when you really see the circuitry working in the heart. Well, you know, and you had told me about a symphony. So I would like you to repeat that if you can. I, I forget what I told you, but <laughs> it was so beautiful. You said when you opened it, you felt like there is a beautiful symphony between the chambers and the... That is very true because uh, just like, you know, this, <clears throat> when the genome project went forward, you know, scientists thought that they had uh, discovered, you know, the Holy Grail except that they found that there was more things to discover. So similarly, uh, for the heart to beat and pump blood, it needs to be very synchronous. So it starts at the macro level by generating electricity and the micro level by conducting through all the branches to the different parts of the heart. And then this is mediated by ions, channels, gap junctions, subcellular, you know, movement of, you know, you know, uh, all charges. And then the excitation contraction, you know, process starts. So yes, it is truly a symphony because right from the time, you know, we, we, we still know kind of the mechanism uh, as to how the heart beats, but we don't know why the heart beats. Saram, Dr. Ram, I'm going to ask you about that 800 pound gorilla. Um, I know you, you know, we all are, um, we're all patients of Swami and you had the unique privilege that Swami was your patient um, in certain ways. And the only thing is I know you have to be careful how you talk, but the question we have is, you know, you had a ex ex good experience of how you landed when you know when you got a call that Swami was in the hospital, if you can tell us about that, that's a very fascinating experience. We like you to relieve for us, Sairam. Sairam, um, I don't for a moment uh, even begin to imagine that anybody can treat Swami. Swami is uh, Swami is that you know higher presence. <clears throat> he took the body, he gave up the body, but he is immensely beyond everything and he is in us all he is with us just the same or even more we feel his presence um, <clears throat> when i uh, when i uh, 
uh, you know, just like uh, uh, all my other patients here, I mean, you know, because of the uh, uh, patient doctor uh, communication privilege, privacy, we don't talk about, but I can tell you this, when, you know, they, they, they put me on notice and saying that <clears throat> you may need to come. And I said, okay, I'll be on standby. Dr. Das had said this. And the, when he told me finally, okay, can you be here? How soon can you be here? So I went to New York City. Uh, we went to get the visa. Those days, if you traveled to India in 2011, you didn't have, I didn't have an OCI card. Uh, if you travel, if you want to travel again within 60 days, you needed uh, some special visa. So I had to get that. So went there, except that we went to the embassy or something like that. We had to go to the consulate. And I was on call that night. It was a Friday. And I worked that morning, went there to New York. And we went to the consulate. The door was closed. And uh, it was 5 o'clock. And there was a long line of people waiting to collect the passports. And I was wondering how I was going to go. And when suddenly one of the officers came and I said, can you help me out? You know, I need a visa. He said, no problem. If he said, if I open the front door, you know, 100 people will get in. I'll open the side door. I'll ask security. <laughs> so they opened the side door. We went in. And I had, uh, I didn't want to talk about the purpose uh, for which I was going, you know, I didn't want to. They had, they had uh, sent me a letter, uh, email, uh, but I did not want to use it. Or so uh, I told the lady at the desk that you know I need to talk to somebody, and she said, "Fine." She went. One of the senior officers immediately came out, and he said, "How can I help you?" I said, "You know, I need a visa. I have to travel." He said, no problem. Those days you had to have documentation of urgency for reason for travel. Nothing. He just took my passport, went inside, <laughs> did the stamp, brought it out, gave me his card. He said, if you have any problems, contact me directly. Go. <laughs> so, uh, uh, yes, those were very... Uh, uh, I think difficult uh, days for everybody. And uh, uh, the only thing that I prayed to Swami at that time was, usually we want his darshan, you know, we want to see him as divinity. I said, Swami, I don't want to see you as divinity. Give me the ability to see you as an ordinary patient in, in my ICU. Because I can't, I, can't, I can't take this divinity thing at this point in time. You know, you can't examine a person if you think that they're divinity. You have to be clear. They're just another. So I don't know whether I was wrong in doing that, but I said, I just want to see you as my regular patients. And he granted me that. <laughs> um, I <clears throat> I remember friends of ours in Cherry Hill. Yeah, one second, let me uh, repeat the question. So the question was, how did you come to see Swami for you know in first time? So, so yeah. So um, I, I remember at one of the you know we were visiting somebody at their house and they had just gone and gone to Puttaparthi and come back, and they are very you know staunch uh, uh, Srinivasans, you know. So they're very, you know, they're, they're, they're long time devotees and their families, you know, uh, were also devotees for a long time. But he, that gentleman, he had never been to Puttaparthi before. And he was telling me that he went there and he had Darshan of Swami. And he said it was like an aha experience, you know, it was a totally different experience and it just grew on him. And he said, you know, things have been so different since then. I feel so peaceful inside. It's a wonderful experience. And we were planning a trip to India. So, you know, it's always the ladies who want to go and visit Puttaparthi and then the men find, you know, excuses to go to other places. So, uh, so we went to uh, Pardi with the kids. And Swami came, we had Swami's darshan. 
And we, at that time, we didn't even know that there was a cafeteria inside. That was the first, very first time that we went. We didn't know that there was accommodation inside. We didn't know about the token system or anything like that. So we went for one darshan. Swami, you know, we saw Swami at a distance. And, uh, and then we were driving back to Bangalore. And I thought to myself, you know, Srinivasan had said he had this aha experience, but nothing happened to me. So uh, I said, OK. Then a week later, after coming back here, I thought about it and said, you know, Srinivasan said that, you know, it transformed him. It's, I said, but nothing happened to me. I said, maybe it'll happen slowly. Well, a month went by, two months went by, three months went by, six months went by. And I said, you know, it's not meant to be for me. <laughs> so it's not going to happen to me. So that's the way I left it until the subsequent visit, until the picture where uh, we got Swami's picture. Thank you, doctor, for sharing such a, um, wonderful experiences and self in introspection uh, that you had with entering into Swami's life. Now, as you were serving in Bangalore with Dr. Das, the super specialty hospital and treating patients who say Sai Ram, Sai Ram, and there is probably in you as well, that connection that you established with Swami more intensely in that environment. Now, when you come back to the US and you're doing your daily job at the hospital, do you get the same connection? If not, how, what did you do? Maybe if you got it, how did you make sure you maintain the same state here? It's a good, uh, thank you for that question. It's a great question. Um, for me, it's simple. The patient is Swami, anesthesiologist is Swami, anesthesia is Swami, the nurses are Swami, and my knowledge is Swami. So I'm just, uh, I'm just, uh, you know, an instrument, just like the surgical instruments. And I leave it at that. Then, then I just concentrate on the uh, procedure. And I mean, there were times when, you know, you run into tough problems and everything. And whoever comes to, that you call on to get this test done, that done, get second opinion, this, that, they're all Swami, that's it. So, you know, that way you can be very functional in spite of the fact that the patient, you know, is crashing or, you know, things happen, you know. So, you know, that uh, avoids a sense of panic. You can be, you can do what you have to do. It was very interesting when you said, I told Swami, I don't want to see you as divinity. I want to see you as an ordinary person. I was immediately reminded of the time where Arjuna tells Bhagwan Krishna that I don't want to see your Vishwarupam. Please come back to your ordinary self where you are my friend. I was totally uh, taken to that spot of the Bhagavad Gita. So I found that a very interesting uh, thinking. I want to know you. Here in this case, he said you are divine, but I want to know you at my level. In there he says, I don't want your Vishwarupa and all, but I want you as a Sakha, as a friend I knew, as a charioteer. That's whom I want. So I thought that was, a, I saw, was thrilled with that uh, thought. Thank you. Thank you. So I think we have no more questions. So with this, um, we will conclude the program, and I'd like to thank Dr. Giraman for making it happen. Um, as we all have been noticing for the last few sessions, right, um, the Samarpan program somehow is not arranged by us, it's arranged by Swami, you know. We try so many people, and everybody who we think is saying yes at the last minute, they said no, and something happens to them. In this case, the opposite happened. It's actually, you know, 
Dr. Raman didn't want to come this week. He said he was very busy and this happens to be the fourth Saturdays when they do the seva activities and he said it won't happen. And somehow, you know, we came to know at the last minute that that seva got pushed to the next week, if I'm correct. So, so yeah. please go ahead. You can talk. The other thing was I, I felt sick last weekend <clears throat> and I was coughing, coughing, coughing every night. And my wife, Vijay, also said, you know, how are you going to go there? And I was kind of scared to call Brother Sai Brady and say, you know, you know, I'm sorry, I may not be able to come. So I thought I'd wing it, I'd take a chance. And here I am, and I'm th thankful to Swami for that. So thanks again. It was such a beautiful talk. And, um, you know, um, like I said, a lot of people were asking about your experience, Swami, and you, I think you conveyed perfectly, you know, like um, that Swami was your patient and it wasn't the, the divinity that we all look at. And that kind of answers a lot of our questions. So we thank you once again, Doctor, for coming in. I think we also uh, need the next round of um, the CPR pro courses at uh, Sarvadharma, which we encourage everyone to attend. Um, it's one of those easiest way to actually save a life. Um, I think we should continue this here and also in India, which I think there's more requirement for there because of the lack of uh, emergency facilities as well as here. So we look forward to it again. And thank you. And uh, I'd like to have Brother Swaminathan come by and felicitate you, please. Come this way. So you can come here, please. Near Swami. Brothers. Now we'll do the Maharti, so you can give the shawl, I can leave it to you.